Take the prayer. Master of all worlds, highest power, merciful parent of compassion, in your presence, eternal one, source of strength for us, as you have been for our ancestors, we very humbly acknowledge you. What are we? What is our life that you have done such great kindness to us? Therefore, we place our appeals before you that you may forgive and absolve us of all our faults and failings, that our faults never become barriers between us and you. That may it be your desire to prepare our hearts to feel awe and love for you. May you listen to these words of ours and may you open our encumbered hearts through the mysteries of your Torah. May this our study be a source of pleasure before your throne of glory like sweet incense. May you shower down upon us the light of our soul source in all the ways by which we define ourselves. May the sparks of your holy servants, through whom you have revealed these words to the world, shine and sparkle. May their merit, their ancestors' merit, and the merit of their Torah, their innocence, and their holiness stand for us so as to prevent us from stumbling when we study these words. In their merit, may our eyes be illumined by what we study, as in the saying of the sweet singer of Israel, open my eyes that I may gaze into wonders of your Torah. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. For it is the eternal who grants wisdom. It is from his mouth that knowledge and understanding issue forth. Na 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 na
Oh, no, 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 Finishing up page 366. Um, and uh, we are uh, discussing the relationship between Joseph and Benjamin and also what they uh, represent in the divine world and in the human world. And uh, um, they uh, um, they're a couple, right? They they are uh, the righteous one above and the righteous one below. So they participate in this one particular uh, um, essential quality, the righteous, uh, but in two different ways. So that was the middle paragraph on page three sixty six that we looked at last time and uh, the paradoxes and the, the mystery of that. Um, now we're at the last paragraph on the page. It is written, as her soul departed, for she was dying. So this is a um, key moment. Rachel uh, has struggled to have children, and she has Joseph, and Joseph is the righteous one above. And then, she has Benjamin, who is the righteous one below here in this world. But having Benjamin is uh, the, last, the last experience she has in this world. She dies after she gives birth to him. So uh, um, what, what, is the, what does the Zohar do with this? So um, we start reading. It is written as her soul departed. Is anybody going to? Step up to read here. Ah, Rabbi, Rabbi, look at the Rabbi, can I ask yes. a question? Richard, yes. Yeah, so um, we've had this long section about Benjamin and Joseph being righteous. And as often happens with me, when three divergent thoughts come together, you know, it kind of sparks something. So I'm just wondering if there's anything to the um, to this thought that um, they're righteous, their, their tribes will not survive. And we've had in the past that oftentimes the righteous must be sacrificed so that um, to appease Satan so that um, we can survive. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that that's going to be the way it plays out. Um, so hold on. Okay. But uh, um, the the uh, the disappearance of uh, of Joseph in one way and Benjamin in another way um, is is uh, noteworthy for sure. Um, so uh, what are we going to do with that? We'll 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 have to see. Um, Joseph, yeah, I don't know. Right now, I I I don't have anything. To, you know, extra to say, although I don't, I don't see it as a sacrificial uh, um, phenomenon. Um, I think it's more about um, the rarity and the uh, um, tenuousness of righteousness in this world. So, uh, but we'll see. I hope. So good. Hold on to that. Um, and now, Beryl, you still want to read? Am I, st am I at the top of the page? No, you're at the middle of the page where it says, it is written as her soul departed, for she was dying. 366. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. Okay. It is written as her soul departed, for she was dying. Come and see. 
Into this lower world, righteous one enters. From it, he emerges, entering in the mystery of Joseph the righteous, emerging in the mystery of Benjamin. As is written, as her soul departed, who is her soul? Righteous one, emerging from her. Benjamin, she named him Ben Ori. Oni. Ben Oni, son of my sorrow, thinking she had given birth below in the world of division, leaving 11 above. <coughs> what is written? But his father called him Benjamin. Benjamin. Benjamin, son of the right, for he ascended above to the higher world, because when Joseph disappeared, Benjamin filled his place. So let's just read the last two uh, lines on the next page, and then we'll come back. So righteous one enters the lower world and emerges. Therefore, Joseph, Benjamin, and all those 12 correspond to the pattern above in undivided unity. So again, we have here um, <clears throat> the, the um, dynamic of the righteous one who both participates in the world above and also in the world below and has to go in and go out, right? Enter and emerge. We talked about that uh, uh, before um, other times. So he enters and then he emerges. This is the, the phrase that uh, indicates um, the successful negotiation of the spiritual and the physical world by a, a, a person or a being here. Right? So the righteous one is able to negotiate that, that mysterious contact that exists between the divine and uh, the human realms. So entering in the mystery of Joseph the righteous, entering what? Joseph the righteous enters um, into union with Malchut with Shechina, uh, with Rachel, and then emerges into this world as Benjamin, right? Um, so the, uh, um, the dynamic is the righteousness of above in the divine world suffuses um, the uh, generative uh, uh, energy of God that then plays out, that goes out into this world, bestowing the possibility of righteousness in this world. And that's Benjamin. So when um, she's dying, for she was dying, um, when she's dying, she gives in her last breath, she gives Benjamin a name. But the Zohar is asking a, a, implicitly a question as her soul departed, for she was dying, it sounds redundant. What's the, why not simply say, as she was dying, she said she called her son Benjamin, Ben, uh, ben Oni, right? Um, what's as her soul departed? Well, the answer that the Zohar gives is, Benjamin is her soul. Benjamin is the soul that she has created. Benjamin, she creates souls. She souls emerge from Shechina into this world. She is the womb that uh, gestates the souls, the spiritual uh, uh, beings created by God to be able to then inhabit this world. They have to sit in the womb of Shechina and then be born into this world. They, we emerge into this world. So each one of us is Shechina's nefesh, we are the soul that Shechina has bestowed into the world. So when it says when her soul departed, it doesn't mean when she was dying. That's what we usually read it as. But it means when her very soul, when her little neshamala was, was uh, born into the world, came out into this world, as she was dying, she named 
this being, this little baby, Ben Oni. Okay, so why did she call Benjamin? That's the name that he's finally identified with. That's what Jacob calls him. But originally she called him Ben Oni. Ben Oni, the son of my sorrow. Right, last week's Torah portion, we had the Vidui Masro, the confessional that we say that we try to give all of the tithes in the proper way. And we say, Loa Khalti Baoni Mi Meno. I didn't eat the mas, the masa, the tithe, um, in its in a state of uh, sadness and mourning. So here she calls him the child of my sorrow. Why? What does the Zohar say? <clears throat> Really? Yeah. Um, it says that she was concerned that he was born to the lower world, the um, which I guess is the human world. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So she doesn't realize that there is this inherent connection between Joseph and Benjamin, that they both partake of the quality of righteousness, Joseph coming from this angle and Benjamin from that angle. She doesn't realize that. She thinks that Benjamin is simply a person born into this world. Like no offense to anybody here, but okay, so I'll say like me, like another human being born into the world. She thought Benjamin was one of those plain human beings. She didn't realize that Benjamin had this inherent connection, bond with Joseph, and that he was actually a continuation of Joseph. He was taking the Josephness from the divine realm and bringing it into the human realm. But he wasn't just simply, you know, a, a, a plain old Joe, um, which is Joseph, right? Um, so, it, it's it's remarkable that uh, second there. It's remarkable that the Zohar is working here again as she does so many so many times um, on two levels: on a divine level, on a spiritual level, on a theosophic level, on a mystical level, and on a human level. Rachel is at the same time Shechina, the mother of all, the one who, who uh, um, is uniting with, with, uh, with Yesod and so on in order to have children. And at the same time, she's a human being herself. The mystery of the connection between Benjamin and Joseph is also a mystery that, that, that applies to her, except in her case, there's a break. There's a, there's, a, there's a division because she doesn't get it. Rachel as Rachel, as the woman who is the one giving birth and dying, the mortal, Rachel doesn't understand the nature of the child that she is giving birth to. She can't see who this child will be and that he will be what he will be because something essential is different about him. She doesn't know that. She can't know that. Um, so I'm starting off by saying this would be um, you know, uh, in, inherent in her being a human being, in, inherent in being uh, um, um, you know, limited in one's uh, apprehensions and in one's capabilities. Mark has a question. Does Rachel think Joseph is dead? How about the divine Rachel? So that's what I'm talking about. How about the divine Rachel? At this point, Joseph is not dead. Nobody thinks Joseph is dead. Joseph hasn't disappeared yet. Um, the whole story of Joseph doesn't come until after Rachel dies. So Joseph is, is, uh, is still around, but... Uh, um, the question of what about the divine Rachel is a good question. Is this not understanding? She gets overruled by Jacob. Jacob says, no, you don't get it. Benjamin is Ben Yamin. He's not Ben Oni. 
right? So uh, it's called mansplaining today, right? Uh, um, that, uh, you know, the mother doesn't get, you know, what, what's happening with her own experience. Um, but, but there's something poignant here where she has this sense of mourning and sadness of, of, uh, that overwhelms her, right? The pain of the, of the, of the birth is combined with the, per, the pain of the, of the dying. Right, what a, what a terrible, you know, uh, contradiction all infused in one for her. Um, and she doesn't then see that, you know, what, a, what, what an achievement it is to, to give forth Benjamin. So I'm starting off by saying this is a very human kind of uh, um, experience where you can't see the whole thing. You, you, you only see one part of it. You don't see how things will develop. You don't see the future. You don't see uh, um, anything beyond your immediate experience. So that's one suggestion. But then coming back to this idea, what if that's not really the whole story? What if even the divine Rachel doesn't get it? Is it possible to, to imagine that? Is it possible to say that even... Rachel, as Shechina, doesn't really understand what's happening with Benjamin. Because that's the nature of the difference between the mother and the child. That's the nature of the difference between Shechina, who, no matter how much she participates in this human world, is still Shechina in, 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 in you know, absolute differentiation from anything in the world below. And yet she gives over life into the world below. Um, to steal from uh, another uh, gathering that we had, um, some of us uh, watched the show, uh, The Good Place, right? And, uh, and we had all kinds of conversations about what that, might, uh, uh, that show might, might help us to do, to think about getting ready for Rosh Hashanah and, 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 and introspection and so on. And one of the questions, one of the challenges that the show puts out is, how can the divine judge the human if the divine is not human? If you don't know what we go through, how can you judge us? How can you understand us? Right? This is uh, one, of the, one of the characters puts that out as, as a complaint. Right? And, and uh, I would suggest that that's actually uh, poignant here. It, it, it touches on something. Rachel, as, as the divine Rachel, is not quite going to understand what the, the mix is that she does not participate in between the, the divine and the, and the human, between the, the, the sublime and the, earth and the celestial and the, and the material and, and the, uh, uh, the physical. Um, she does it. She makes it happen. She makes it possible. She enriches the world with life every single second. But how's she gonna really actually get the whole story? She, she's not gonna be capable of doing that. To a certain degree, uh, um, uh, Shechina is, is, uh, is a tragic hero. Because Shechina is the one part of God that constantly has to turn away from all the rest of God and deal with all the other stuff. Right? All the rest of, of God's array of Godness is safely ensconced within that divine bubble. And all the, the dynamics that go on um, are within uh within safe divine parameters shina is sentenced to a different role she is constantly being taken away from her divine desires her desire to be at one with her lover to be at one with all of the rest of of the divine family so to speak of forces She's constantly being taken away from that to, to, to give out 
of the best of what she has inside to a realm that is not hers. I mean, it's hers only in this kind of custodial or, or caring kind of way, um, but it's never really a, the same, you know, uh, uh, um, identical substance, essence, you know, to use Christian terms from, from uh, medieval times. There's a, there's a, there's a break. Shechina is God and I'm not, right? While Shechina is God and Netzach is God and Yesod is God and Tiferet is God and Bina is God. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a whole different uh, um, reality that Shechina has to inhabit that can't be uh, comfortable. Shechina, to use the kind of terms that we use a lot of times in the Bible, Shechina is a gear in this world. Shechina is a stranger in this world. Even when she's successful, even when she is uh, uh, functioning, you know, terrifically, but she's not quite you and me, right? She's, she's bonded to you and me. She's, um, you know, constantly connected to us, and yet there's something a little bit different. Part of that paradox is here. Part of that paradox is not only a given over to us in the, in the different way, her, the different perspective that she, that she has about the birth of Benjamin. It's, it's part of the fact that she dies giving birth to Benjamin. Because that in the end is really um, you know, the French say that every, every act of coitus is a little death. Um, but it's, it's her dying is about, to, to use uh, you know, Rich's term before, it's, it is, is a sacrificial act here, right? There's a kind of a, it sounds even a little Christian, right? She, in order to create life that's not divine, that's not exactly of the same uh, a reality is hers. That's a kind of a re of, of a renunciation. That's a kind of a giving up of of uh, you know a, an aspect of her life as 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 God. So that's that's part uh, I think of of the uh, of the very intense uh, uh, pain that is voiced by her, and then Jacob overrules it. Because Jacob says, maybe that's the right name for Benjamin for you. But that's not the name for us in this world. For us in this world, Benjamin is amazing. He's the person who takes over righteousness when Joseph finally disappears. He's got this capability of being, um, you know, a second Joseph. So Joseph is in imbued with that divine role. And now here's a guy who's not divine. Benjamin is not divine. And nevertheless, it's totally special, totally empowered to be righteous. What a miracle. Benjamin is the, the paradigm of the mystery of the human being created in God's image. Right? He is the one who, in this, in this you know, uh, game that the Zohar is playing here with the sons and so on, he's the one who actually presents this miracle that human beings can actually act like God, even though they're not God, not to be confused with God, right? Not the son of God who therefore is God. No, we are the sons of God, who are nothing other than human. And yet look at how God-like we can act. So if I was being Christianized a little bit before, now I'm polemicizing the other way, right? No, but this is actually very important because the claim, the son of God is God for the, for the, for the Jewish tradition is, no, you made a big mistake. The son of God is literally not God, but the son of God, not God. God is not a hereditary dynasty. God is God. There's only one God. 
But the, the unbelievable mystery is that God creates life that is not God. It's in God's image, but it's not God. And that's why Benjamin is the son from the right side, the son of all giving. Right? This is the most generous thing that God could do. Right? To give life into the world without owning it. Right? Without, uh, um, you know, spreading over it, you know, a, a, a divine uh, um, existence. Right? To actually say, okay, you know what? I'm going to let there be life. Let there be life. And there was life. And let that life not be God. So that's the giving. And that's the right side. That's the, that's the Yamin. Okay. Um, any comments, questions? All right. We got away with that one. We're this up to three. Time, what? This time, I will praise yud heh vav -Hey. Okay, so that's like we always have. That's in the indentation. So that's the lead-off phrase of a verse, right? This is what Leah says when she gives Judah his name. So we're back to the namings. And now instead of Rachel naming uh, her son, we have Leah naming her son. She names Yehuda and she goes this time, Hapa'am Odel Hashem. So the word Odeh, I will praise, is Yehuda. Yehuda is praise and thanks, right? So that's the, that's the, uh, uh, the root of the name. Okay, so now Rabbi Shimon is gonna start explaining. Rabbi Shimon opened, I will praise yud heh vav -Hey with all my levav, heart, in the council of the upright and the assembly, with all my levav, heart. This verse should read, with my lev, lev, heart. But David sought to praise the Blessed Holy One in the supernal mystery of the Holy Name. I will praise yud heh vav -Hey with all my levav, with the good impulse and the evil impulse, two sides, one on the right and one on the left. Okay, what are we gonna do with this? So this is again, like standard Midrash. Start with a verse from someplace else, very often from Psalms, and we'll eventually get down to uh, uh, Yehuda. But the word praise is in this verse from Psalms, right? Ode, right? Which is the same word that, that Leah said. So I will praise the eternal, all right? Uh, right? With, with all of my heart. And again, the Zohar notices as the Midrash earlier had noticed, uh, you see it in the notes as well. The word levav is sometimes the way the word heart is written. But the simplest way to write, word to write to write it is lave. So with one bet, lamed bet, but um, levav is lamed bet bet. So why two bets? Why is it written in that way? So the same question is asked when we have the first paragraph of the Shema: Viahavta et Hashem elokecha bechol levavcha. Right? Why does it say levavcha, your heart, with a levav? Why doesn't it say bechol libcha, with all your heart? Lev. That's a simple word. So what did the rabbis answer over there? How do you love God with all your heart? So they said the, the extra base is two. The letter base is the, is the numerical value two. It's the second letter in the, in the alphabet. Stands for two. It's doubled here. Lamed bet bet. So the doubling is really important. And the answer is we have two impulses, right? Love God with your good impulse and love God even with your evil impulse. That's the way the rabbis said uh, that, you know, that, that uh, verse uh, makes sense. So now that Zohar is applying that same idea to David in the Psalms, 
where it says, Ode Hashem So what is what is why does he choose Livavi and not Libi? So the answer is he wants to praise God with everything that he's got, everything in his heart, whether it's uh, his good impulse or his evil impulse. But the way that the Zohar puts it here is um, pushing it a little bit, right? There's a little edginess to it. But David sought to praise the Blessed Holy One in the supernal mystery of the Holy Name. I will praise Yod Hei with all my Levav, with the good impulse and the evil impulse, two sides, one on the right and one on the left. This has to do with God. Does this seem to imply that God has an evil impulse and a good impulse? It certainly sounds a little bit like that, but that's not quite the way uh, the Zohar means it. Although the Zohar like walks right up to the edge of that meaning. The right side and the left side for God are chesed on one side, gvura on the other side, right? Unending love and generosity and giving on the one side and judgment with, uh, with withdrawal, circumspection, Judge, uh, judging uh, and distinguishing all of that on the left side. So that's right and left. Both of them, of course, are good. They're all part of the good. And yet, says the Zohar, on a human level, that dichotomy translates into good and evil. Right? That right and left that is that is experienced by human beings ends up getting, you know, uh, besmirched. I think the word besmirched comes from the word smutch, shm you know, schmutz. Um, so it gets, it gets dirty. It gets, it, it becomes defiled. And, and instead of it being a right side and a left side, it becomes a good side and an evil side. So David is saying, I want to praise God in a way that affirms God's oneness that God is both right side and left side. And for a human being, paradoxically, that ends up meaning to try to unite my good side and my evil side. So it's, it's a, a translation, right? So much is lost in translation. That's what happens. So coming back to that the whole long disquisition I said before about the, the human uh, coming out of the divine, this is part of the price. Part of the price of the human coming out of the divine is what's lost in translation. The right and the left becomes degraded into good and evil. And nevertheless, though, we can push back. Right? We can try to overcome that dichotomy in the name of God. So that's what David wants to do. All right, we continue. In the council of the upright. The Sod Yisharim. That's the word it's in, in, in Hebrew. The Sod Yisharim. <coughs> I just want to uh, interrupt, as I always do, for a second, um, that that uh, term, Sod, of course, is a very important term in mystical literature. The word Sod means mystery, secret. Here it's translated as Sod council. Why? How could that be? What's the what's the what's the semantic field that allows this to happen? The answer is that that's how people do. They take counsel by sharing secrets with each other, by trusting each other to say, "I can talk to you about this, and you won't uh, betray me. You won't you won't misunderstand me." Um, when we had uh, uh, Slichot uh, last Saturday night, we have, <coughs> we have a verse that we recite, Asher Yachdav Nam Tiksod. Together, let's engage in a sweet secret together. That or, Hashem Let's go to God's house with feeling, with a lot of feeling. So the idea is to reach out to another person who shares some of your own concern or passion or, or, or love for something. And that in itself is a kind of a secret. But you find somebody else to share that secret. 
That's counsel. That's sharing counsel with somebody else. That's to be able to, to uh, uh, find uh, a soulmate, to borrow another one from, from, from the, other, you know, the other series. So, so that's what it is. is besod yesharim, in the shared counsel of the upright who speak the same language, who are concerned about the same kinds of things, who can say the number of the joke and everybody gets it, you know, it, it's a kind of a, that's the shared secret. Okay, so in the Council of the Upright. The other directions of this world, for Levav corresponds to South and North. In the Council of the Upright, the other directions of the world, corresponding above, the Eda and the assembly site, Yehuda. Site of Yehuda. Site of Yehuda. Judah, as is written, the Edoti, my testimony, that I will teach them. And similarly, Judah, Ode, still rules with God. Okay, speaks for itself. Um, so the verse in the Hebrew is, Psalm 111, Ode Hashem Bechol Levav, Besod Yesharim Ve'eda. Right? So Besod Yesharim in the Council of the Upright and the Assembly. Right? Ve'eda. Okay, so the way the Zohar now reads it is David is trying to unify, to try to encompass the unified field theory of God. I want to be able to appreciate God in all of God's multipleness of oneness. So therefore, Bechol Levav, the right and the left. Okay, And then, Sod Yesharim, the other directions of this world. Okay, So if you see 382, Other directions of this world, symbolizing the other four sifrot, which complete the six directions of Hesed through Yisod. Right, so these directions are not simply directions. They are ways of, ref of referring to the divine elements, the divine centers of energy. So there's right and there's left. And then there's the other uh, aspects of, of, of God that uh, uh, continue to ramify as God unfolds. Okay, so that's the Sod Yesharim, because the Sod, the secret is how these multiple facets of God are still only one, right? They're all together and they are in council with each other. And then Ve'eda, Ve'eda is Judah. So, where does where does Ada fit into this God diagram? Ada is Judah. Judah is the tribe out of which comes who? King David, who is a king and eventually the source of the messianic redemption of Israel. So King Malchut is sovereignty, royalty, and that's another name for the famous name that we use most of the time, which is, everybody together, unmute yourselves and say, Shechina. Thank you. Okay, so right, so Yehuda ends up being the one who instantiates Shechina, Shechina as Malchut, the one who is in charge of the world, right? And um, now the Zohar says an assembly. Why assembly? Because Shechina is where everything gets collected, right? Where all of the uh, counsel of the upright gets poured in, gets poured into her. So that's the Eida. So that's already, again, uh, acknowledging um, a part of God. And then we have additional words that are given over to Judah. 
right? So Judah is Yehuda. And as the note says that there's a kind of a sound word play, you know, sound play and word play. Ve'edoti, my testimony. Uh, I will teach them, right? That's another verse in, in Psalms. And Yehuda Od, you know, Rad um, uh, Im Hashem, right? So Od means more or more so or evermore, right? We say ain't Od, right? So the, the word Od sounds like Yehuda and Edoti comes from the word testimony, right? An aid is a test is, is a witness, right? And Ada is an assembly, a community. So all of these words apply to Yehuda, right? The the uh, um, the uh, um, thankfulness of of Leah is that she's given that extra child. She's given one more child, Hapam. Wow, this time I'm going to praise God. And we've talked about this many times. Leah, in the simple reading of the story, every one of her children before this, the three children, are products of a competitive uh, uh, contest. She wants to somehow prove that she's better than Rachel. And she wants to try to prove to Jacob that he should love her. Finally, with Judah, she goes, you know what? The heck with all of that ulterior motive stuff. This, this boy is simply the one that I want to thank God for. I'm just going to thank God for this boy. Thank you. So that's part of what is, is happening here. Yehuda is that moment of truth that Leah finally arrives at. That it's just good that she has a child and that the child is not supposed to serve somebody else's, uh, including her, uh, um, benefit uh, or, or uh, uh, you know, goals or so on. So, and that's, that's why it's, it's surplus, right? It's just surplus value. It's just extra value that's created uh, for no other reason other than that it just is. It's another life. It's another life that, that, that uh, I, have, I have created. Um, and she bears testimony to that, right? The Edoti. She is saying this, uh, bearing witness uh, to this fact. So this is all Yehuda, and this is uh, um, the establishing of Shechina. Remember, she succeeded in having the three other children. Besides her own personal agenda, she ends up creating, from the Zohar's perspective in the last few pages, she ends up creating the paradigms for Chesed, Gvura, and Tiferet, right? So those are the three key, key uh, forces of divinity. And now she succeeds in creating the fourth, in Shechina. This means she has completed the Merkava. She has completed the chariot upon which God's presence rests and, and moves. Right, so she is uh, given the gift of, of uh, creating all of these four super, super uh, consequential uh, um, um, beings. Okay. Yet it is written. Yet it is written, I will praise you with all the be my heart before Elohim I will sing to you referring here to a single sight as is written before Elohim I will sing to you for he proclaimed song to this rung to unite her with the right okay so the Gemara the, Gemara, the Zohar is asking an implicit question David was so interested in, in uh, um, embracing God in God's fullness, and therefore he's using his fullness, levavi, as he makes a point of using uh, that term before. So how come in Psalm 138, he says as follows. He says, Odecha bechol libi neged elokim azamercha. 
Azamrach, I'm sorry, Azamrach, gotta get a bigger print here. Um, so again, the Ode is the beginning. I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna thank, I'm gonna acknowledge God. But here he says, Behol be. Why doesn't he say Behol Avi? What's the answer? The answer is this is a direct address. The other verse was talking about embracing God. Now, and he's talking to others. Here, David is talking to God. Odecha, I will praise you. And therefore, when, when David does that, he says, but you know what I need to do to bring to you? What do I need to bring to you? What, is, what, is, what does he say? For he proclaimed song to this wrong to unite her with the right. I have to bring to you the capability of uniting with the right. You are too much left on left sided. You're too much on the left. And I have to enable you to come over into the right. So Libi, one factor, not both sides of my heart, not the right side and the left side, but I'm bringing my right side here to bear because I want to bring you, I want to pull you over from your left to come closer to the right. This is very, very audacious, right? Because what is this about? This is saying the first one again, the first verse is David talking to us. And David saying, I wanna be able to praise God. I'm gonna bring all of me to praise God because God is all encompassing and, and, uh, and so on. Now this verse, this Psalm, is not God, uh, David talking about God to us. This is David encountering God and saying, you need me. You need me. I can give you something that you're lacking at this point. You, God, need me to bring my right side of my heart to you in order to enable you to be able to move closer to union with the right. I can give this to you. You need this from me. This is, of course, one of the great claims of the Zohar and of this tradition, that God needs us for certain things. Once God has given us the floor, so to speak, the world, then we have things to give to God that God requires that only we can give. So Shechina is, you know, in, in limbo a little bit, right? Shechina is not automatically united with the right side. She's not capable of doing that all by herself. So we, and that means every human being, has to bring our heart the goodness of our heart to Shechina so that we can nudge her, we can push her over into um, a more uh, uh, giving place. So that's, that's, the, that's the claim here. Okay, let's continue. Come and see. Judah embraces all sides, embracing South, embracing east, for he derives from the left side originating from the north, and he embraces south since he moves to the right, linking with the body. So this time I will praise yud heh vav -Hey. Okay. Um, let's just read the next two lines. Vata Amod, she stopped giving birth. Vata Amod, she stood, standing firm, standing fittingly, the entire holy chariot arranged. Okay. So by accomplishing this, Leia Vata Amod, she comes into full stature. Not she stopped. That's the simple meaning of the term. Vata Amod, we let it. She stopped uh, giving birth. She had four kids and then she didn't have any more kids for a while. No, but by giving birth to these four kids, she stood, right? She ended up in attaining um, 
you know, the, the, the full standing of, of, of uh, what she was capable of. So how is that? Because of that last child, because of Judah. So Judah is, as we said, Judah is identified with Shechina. And how we, and then we have this kind of like circular kind of way of describing how Judah encompasses all the directions. Right? He embraces all the sides, all the directions. Judah will take in all of the aspects of God and include them within him or her. Right? Embracing south, embracing east. Okay, so look at 386. Embracing south, east. Judah, symbolizing Shina in the west, joins with Hesed and Teferit, south and east. Right. So if we look at the diagram that we have in our books, we understand that this is top, bottom, side to side. So the top is east. That makes the bottom west. Right. The right therefore is south. south. The right side is south and the left side is north. Okay, so he embraces the south, that is Judah is Shechina and embraces east. So that's the right side, right? But he derives from the left side originating from the north. The north and the left are the same thing. Why do we say that Judah derives from the left side? Who is Judah's mother? Who does Judah derive from? Leah. Oh. Leah. Where is Leah in the divine geography, in the divine uh, 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 direction? Uh, uh, system. Bina, I think, right? Bina. Yeah, where is Bina? North. Left side. North. On the left. Right? Bina is on the left. So we have associations with left that are not so great, right? The, the, the right side is this giving, wonderful, terrific, the part that we make that we get very happy about. The left side is the part that is a little more withholding, a little more limiting. We get a little nervous about it. If you go too much to the left, it becomes evil. That's, the, that's what we said earlier today, right? The, the, the whole evil array of, of uh, forces are like camped out right across the border, you know, like Mexico and the United States, right? Right across the border, there are all these bandidos, right? There's all these uh, uh, bad hombres that are uh, ready to infiltrate uh, if they if they get a chance, and they will take advantage of Shechina's vulnerability if they are allowed to. So Shechina is tending toward the left, right? Her mother is up on the left, but her mother on the left we've talked about before is actually in on the left, which is more in the center because she's not split from the right. The right and the left where, where Bina and Chochmah are, are not split apart. Right. So, you know, it's like, it's, uh, it's like saying that I'm over here, this is my right and my left, right? There, there is no right and left over there. But nevertheless, Bina is to the left to a, to a degree. And that's why David before says, I gotta bring you over to the right. I wanna, I wanna you know, inch you more over to the right. So here, as Judah begins, he derives from the left, and the left is the north. He embraces the south since he moves to the right. In order to get to the south, he has to get more to the middle. How does he get to the middle? By moving rightward. Once he gets moving to the right, then he can go down uh, um, and, and uh, um, take the chesed, take the lovingness of, of all that there is. Linking with the body, what does that mean? So the body is the torso, the goof, right? The body is also the, um, 
um, the uh, the phallus, the phallus, right? This is the body. This is where the body ends. This is where the body culminates. So shchina unites with the body, the divine body, the divine body, the divine source. So the the the, the place where all of God's uh, vigor um, is concentrated. Right. So therefore, shchina is able to one way or another touch bases with everything. David. This, am I muted? No, you're okay. Now you are. Now this, you're not. This undertaking to uh, move the left to the right, to be in touch with all directions, really sounds like what we had identified to ferret as. Right. The problem is. Surprising. Yeah. The, the problem is Teferit is too high up there. Teferit is up in, in, you know, in the divine torso. But how is that going to get translated? We talked about, I said translation before. How is that going to get conveyed into the non-divine world? That's the problem. So Teferit is the body who will unite with Shechina who is the all-encompassing one, in order to pour forth this unified uh, um, uh, power so that then she can then give birth out into the world, into a world that's full of those possibilities. So, so yeah, you're right. It starts with Tiferet. Tiferet is the one that first brings the right and the left together, but not yet in the in the, in the stage of of uh, of the erotic uh, generative um, energy which we need to create a world. The ferret can't create a world by 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 its by itself by themselves. The ferret can only create a world through shchina. So you need uh, shchina to be the border between uh, Texas and Mexico in order to uh, to. Uh, Right. Shechina is that gate. Shechina is a gate. But Shechina is a gate that doesn't close. Shechina lets the divine flow out into the world. And Shechina is the open gate that allows all of the humans to connect up with God, to enter into union with God. And if they're extraordinary, they can go even further than just touching Shechina. Right? They, can, they can become at one with God beyond that. But Shechina is the beckoning open door. She's the open door for Tiferet. She's constantly saying, come, come unite with me. And then she gives out the life into this world. And then she turns around and says to the life in this world, come, unite with me. So how is this Yehuda and not Binyamin? So Binyamin is Yesod. Binyamin oh. is the giver that, that uh, is righteous into this world. Right? That, that, that's what Joseph is. Joseph is Yesod. Joseph is the culminating point of Tiferet. Joseph is, is the, the, the phallus. Right? Joseph is the member that allows Tiferet to penetrate into Shechina. And on the other side, the other side of the gate, what allows human beings to penetrate into the gate, that's the quality of Benjamin. So they're not the gate, Judah is the gate, and, and, uh, and Benjamin is the one who's trying to enter the gate through righteousness. Right, you cannot, you, you know, you have to be righteous to enter. All right. More, anybody? Okay. So we're going to start a new little story. We have a little bit of time. Um, here we go. Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon went out to the villages. He encountered Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Hia and Rabbi Yossi. Upon seeing them, he declared, innovations of Torah are required here. They okay, said- one second, one second. 
So that, that he goes out, the, the note says, go look in the Gemara for this, this uh, uh, phrase. Um, it's usually taken to mean that he had holdings, that he was quite uh, a, uh, a wealthy man and that he had uh, you know, subsidiary tracts of land that had uh, people working the fields and living there and so on. So that was, that's the villages, right? That's that. So he's going out to inspect his property. He's going out to see what's going on uh, with, with all of his uh, assets. So he's on a business trip. That's the way it starts. But on the way, guess what happens? He bumps into Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Chia, and Rabbi Yossi, right? So he bumps into how many sages? Three. Right, three plus one is four. Four, good. So we're we're doing good here. We're we're we we got it, and that's what we just were talking about. That's what Leia accomplishes. She's vatamo. She's able to stand straight and proud because she has the four sons who become the four wheels of the chariot, right? The four legs of the chair of God's throne, right? the ones that are going to support and sustain God's being. So now look at that. Coincidence? I don't know. But here is Rabbi Shimon, uh, who bumps into these other three uh, sages, who are, of course, his disciples. And then he says, oh, we have to do some chidush Torah. We have to give some innovations of Torah. We have to make some new Torah here. Because otherwise, what's the point of being four sages together? Right? We, need to, we need to, you know, support uh, the chariot. We need to be the chariot. So here we go. They sat for three days. As they were about to leave, each one opened with a verse. Okay. Rabbi. So, so uh, before we get into what they say, we'll get into uh, some, some Torah. But what, what do we have here? in this little micro story. The answer is that we don't have much, but the Zohar insists on telling us this little narrative. They sat for three days. Yeah, and what happened? What did they do? What, was, what, what transpired? What, what, was going, what was said? Innovations of Torah required here? Okay, so what did they say for three days? And what does the Zohar say? I'm not gonna tell you any of that. I'm just going to tell you what they said as their parting words when they were about to get moving again. Right? So all of that other stuff is a mystery. Whatever happened during those three days, we will never know. Or maybe we will know one day, but we're not going to know right now. The Zohar is not going to give it away. So that, that secret during those three days, that belongs to them, not to us. Only after they're, they're, they're getting, you know, packing up to go, then we get this kind of like little edge of the end of that experience that allows us a little, uh, a, a little glimpse of stuff that they would be saying. Sandra, yeah, what do you want to say? Um, nothing, it, well, everything is meaningful. So what's the significance of three days? Yes, yeah, so I don't there's numbers here, four rabbis, three days, what's going on? Yeah, so um, you'd have to look at those uh, references to see what the, uh, Danny Matt thinks the significance is. Um, I didn't look at them. So I, right now, I don't know what he has in mind, um, but um, we do know that there is a unit of three days that's very significant as the three days prior to the giving of the Torah. Okay. It's called Shloshet Yemei Hagbala. The three days where people prepare themselves to get the Torah. Right. So in that sense, what we have here is this three days of preparation, and we don't know how, we don't know what. And now, okay, and now they're going to start giving out Torah. Right? Now, after those three days, that's what's happening. So that would be my suggestion. I don't know if that jibes with what the other... Uh, uh, References are. I, I didn't get a chance to look. No, so, I was interested in what you thought. I think all kinds of things. It's, uh, the I know. Is, what does it mean over <laughs> here? So, yeah, 
Okay. Anyway, that's my suggestion. So, um, okay. As they were as they were about to leave, each one opens, and opens with a verse. And guess what? At this point, we'll stop. And we'll sit for uh, for three days or for three weeks or something like that. Uh, this is our last session um, until after Sukkot. So I look forward to resuming on September 30th. So it's uh, almost a month from now. Um, but I want to wish everybody a Shana Tova Mituka, really good, better year, a year of sweetness uh, with many, many blessings that uh, we can't even imagine what they might be uh, for everybody in their own way. And uh, all good things, okay, and and health too. Okay. And you too, Rabbi. Okay. Too. Okay. Be well, everybody. Oh, thank you. Thank you.